Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dagger Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. And yeah, I did just launch a gaming channel a, a bit ahead of schedule from what I had originally planned. But don't worry, I'm still going to be posting full-length movie reviews just as often. Such as today's video, Carnosaur 2. You already know about Carnosaur, of course, as that was reviewed last week, but the sequel is actually quite different from the first, despite being released very soon after the original. None of the characters from the last film get so much as referenced, and the overall style shifts drastically. I'm sure you're wondering, mutant chickens, virus, or both? They kind of mention the mutations briefly, and then it's completely forgotten. Much like the Dionychus, now replaced with big fucking velociraptors infesting a mining facility. Thus, when communication is lost with the outside world, a small team of ragtag electrical engineers are hired by a shifty guy with a financial connection to the situation, and they must go forth to investigate the site and search for survivors. That already sounds kind of familiar. But anyway, as I still haven't seen Jurassic World, let's take a look at Carnosaur 2 so that I might get my dinosaur fix. I really wanted to be a paleontologist. Opening up to the ever-cost-effective stock footage of the last movie, we soon discard that to go down to what is actually important, the setting. That being the mine, or facility. They kind of merge together, to be honest. This has to be the most well-furnished mine I've seen in all science fiction. Not to say they don't have problems, such as the wires spontaneously being ripped to shreds, and a bad case of horror cliches. Who's there? I said, who's there? And I said... Ah! Wow. When Gorman rips off Jurassic Park, he rips sound effects straight from Jurassic Park! Which is bad enough to kill a miscellaneous grunt who no one cares about because we've got to introduce a far more important character. A, a teen. Jesse Turner, played by Ryan Thomas Johnson. I mean, sure, he's a teen and important and has that damn long hair that's only three inches. I'm sure he's not entirely a walking 90s cliche through and through. Just a few more seconds. Ah, nailed it. And I'm sure my dog is not going to start pooping solid gold? Kudo? Or the kid happens to be in the care of one of the workers at this high-security government facility who also finds the damage in the tunnels, along with the remains of Garth Brooks, and naturally assumes that the kid is the one responsible. We were just trying to have a little fun. Fun? Damn it, Jess. Do you realize there's a lot of damage down here? Responsible for the wires, which he must have ripped out with his Hulk smash powers, and the dynamite, which we clearly see him being caught red-handed trying to steal. But no one seems to care about the fate of that country music star. Come on, I gotta get you out of here before somebody else finds out about it. High security, government facility, and no one seems to have noticed douchey McAssface stuffing his backpack with dynamite? Which is even more ridiculous when you take into account that later they establish this place has a closed-circuit TV surveillance system. But forget all that. We've got important details to establish. Don't wander up, all right? Aside from Jesse's belief that all conversations are conducted with reverse psychology. Wanna give it a shot? What? Well, yeah, sure. Take the reins. While his caretaker unfairly limits his access to the basic human right of high explosives, everyone else seems more than happy to let him just fuck around with the heavy equipment. I mean, it's not like they're doing anything with it. Whatever you do, don't throw this lever up. It operates the automatic doors over there. 150 feet straight down. The top brass insists that installing a suicide pit was a foolish waste of resources, but what do they know? I'm sure it'll come in very handy if we ever happen to have a climactic battle in this area. More importantly, their systems have completely gone down, but they managed to get a call into a repair crew before communications were cut. So the electrician is expected in a few hours. With nothing else to contribute to the plot, everyone takes a break in the mess hall. Let's see, it's a horror movie with unimportant characters spending exorbitant amounts of time showing them performing unimportant tasks. Oh, that was a... What does this mean again? Oh. Yeah, but normally this is 
done with only, like, one or two characters early in the movie, not 80% of the frickin' cast. Which means chaos, death, and lots of Jurassic Park sound effects, though we don't actually see the beasts yet. Instead, moving on to our still-alive cast, who's considerably more worth the trouble of rattling off, starting with our lead, John Savage, as Jack Reed. Who just can't bear the thought of the family he lost which we never met and only know about because he insists on plastering their pictures all over that locker so that he can be reminded every day of that thing he's trying to get over. We also quickly establish the rest of the characters and their traits, such as Monk, the douchebag, played by Rick Dean, no-nonsense tough girl Sarah Rawlins, played by Arabella Halsberg, and Miguel Nunez as... The fuck is wrong with you, Monk? You got the roses looking thick? Ed Moses. You can't really complain too much about his character, it's not like he's written any worse than any other motherfucker on set. Like their boss, Don Stroud, playing Dollar Store Michael Ironside, Ben Kahane. And the man who hired them for this job, and thus their boss's boss, Tom McQuaid, played by Cliff D. Young. Whom I distinctly remember from 2012 Doomsday. Seeing him in a Corman flick at least lets me know that the Asylum didn't have to pay too much to get him in that. Oh, yeah, but what is that mission? Yucca Mountain is a military-operated uranium mine. As such, we periodically send 17-year-olds into the lower depths. Think of them as modern-day canaries. Our communication went down right after they called in, and we haven't been able to get a hold of them since. Now, normally, this facility is off-limits to civilian personnel. Well, if they're gonna be this fucking hard-ass about it, can someone please explain to me what the two fucking kids' roles in the military were? Well, if your people know so much, then why aren't they pulling their asses out of bed? is starting to feel pretty damn familiar. It, it, probably nothing. The point is I have to fly in, find out what went wrong, and fix the problem, like unreasonably heroic electricians. This calls for some badass music. Or public domain. It could work too. Thus, they fly in, set down, and move to enter the installation. Hey! Works for me! Oh, looking really familiar! In seconds, they realize they've got bigger problems than some faulty wiring. Hey, look, you know, this shit is not our problem. I say we just get the others and get the hell out of Dodge pronto, huh? Yeah. It's... It's... it's this... Seriously! Wait a second. What's this? He's in shock. He must have been here when it happened. Fucking! It's aliens! It's shot for shot an incredibly cheap and shockingly abridged version of aliens! Fuck! And Fox says that I'm stealing from them! Well, you know the plot now, but just to confirm, the crew sets up base in the unreasonably complex operations room, storing the kid who da -da -da -da, won't say a word in the convenient infirmary about 15 feet away, which now is at maximum capacity, it seems. Yeah, it's like the whole crew just took off, just bugged out! No, no, there's desert 80 miles around this place. The chopper's the only way in or out. It's 80 miles. You mean to tell me none of the motherfuckers had a truck? Fuck, they could just drive the forklift if they had to! Despite being there all of ten minutes, suddenly everyone wants to quit and go home. However, Burke pulls rank and threatens their pilot's job if they leave. Which unfortunately means we have to keep watching this movie. Don't worry, I'll look after him. Yeah, you just wipe his face with that towel, get him some cocoa, tell him how much of a pretty little girl he is. Still, they strangely can't get the communications equipment to work or with all the ripped out wires, but that doesn't mean they can't try. Oddly enough, the computer still functions, and it gets somewhere, but run into trouble with classified information. Damn thing won't let me know those two bottom sub-levels. Don't worry about it, move on. Whatever you say, Burke. Whoop, there it is. Is it now? Yes, as they found the area, the wires are cut through the power of big-ass computers. Therefore, while Burke is busy hiding compromising information, the rest of the team heads out to repair the electricity. You know, it's a lot easier to get emotionally invested when it's a group of innocent colonists or something, but... Yeah, sure. Cables and shit. Whatever. The movie's got our emotions covered with Reed, who explains the sad story behind his locker pictures. He had a family, 
now doesn't. Probably something to do with being frozen for 57 years. No worries, that's enough to get the kid to respond. Oh god, help us. Now, wait a minute. Did they actually kidnap that child and now he's just realizing he's in a Corman production? Whatever the case may be, gender-swapped Newt is on the road to recovery, while the main group of amazingly suicidal electricians are on the road to the restricted sublevels. Oh, you got me? <laughs> Falling prey to the raptors, who coincidentally enough take out the highest ranking man there. Fuck, I really don't have to cover the plot from here on out, do I? I guess it does get a bit mixed up, as when everyone screams and retreats, Newt Boy fucking panics and runs off too! Probably because these dinosaurs have magical teleporting powers. Okay, it's all now. Okay, is that actually going to kill him or is it just going to stand there bitch slapping the man for the remainder of the running time? It eventually gets him dragging the guy up into the vents, a raptor's natural habitat. Thus, everyone opts to leave the installation entirely, with Corporal Farrow being the first on the helicopter. It's hardly a surprise when I've already seen this damn movie! If they don't hear from us, you think they'll send someone? I don't know, Jess. We better head back inside. It will be night soon, and they most commonly arrive at night. Most commonly. This annoying fucking interruption is brought to you by Fox. Please click the annotation, if I can, or just check the bottom of the video, the description. Check out part two.